sailing since we're on an island and maybe people have been on sailboats and stuff. So the easiest example is, so we're gonna have a top-down view. So if we're looking down at the boat, And maybe the so I'll draw the direction of the wind in with red arrows. So when the wind is just blowing directly into the sails, obviously you're gonna get some force of the wind pushing you to the right. And so that'll give you a velocity to the right. And so in this picture, this is just a consequence of uh, conservation of momentum, right? Because you could imagine this as collisions of the particles that make up the wind, so the air particles hitting the sail and doing some kind of collision with the sail and that making the boat have a velocity to the right. So this is this doesn't really have to do with uh, fluid dynamics other than the fact that the wind is moving. Where fluid dynamics can come into play is if we have a boat trying to go the opposite direction. Oh, so this is a boat. And this is the sail. So if we have a boat trying to go the other way, and the wind is in the same direction, If we were only relying on conservation of momentum, then the boat couldn't go into the wind if it was just trying to use conservation of momentum. The, the sail would fill up and make you go backwards, and that's not what we want. So how this works is, let's see if I can draw. So as the wind interacts with the sail now, some of it is going to travel along this path. And then some of it would instead go up and around the other way. So if you look at the curve of the sail, then if you imagine like a track or going around in a circle, then if you go around the outside of a circle, then this path length is longer And this is a shorter path length. So if you imagine running around a track, the inside lane of the track is shorter than the outer lanes of the track.
So if we remember our flow rate and let's call this the flow in the front Q Q front, and this is Q back. Area one, velocity or area front. Velocity front equals area back, velocity back. So because the front has a longer path length, that's gonna mean that the area is increased. Shorter path length, area is decreased. Maybe I'll do this separately. And so the, the result of this is that the pressure more so the pressure in the front is going to be less than the pressure in the back. And so because there's less pressure at the front of the sail than at the back of the sail, then you're going to have some net force that pushes the sail and therefore the boat into the wind. Let me, are people still working on this slide? So let me go to a new slide and see if we can explain that a little better. So. From Bernoulli's principle or equation, We had that 
pressure plus one half rho V squared plus rho G H was a constant. And if we're looking at the sailboat, we can just say that the wind is all at the same height. And so the, this height part is not gonna come into play. So if we looked at the pressure front plus one half rho V front squared, Pressure back plus one half rho velocity back squared. And then we had Q So like I said, the, the heights are the same, so we can just cancel out those terms. And so this equation in the red box is called Bernoulli's principle. And so as long as we get the, so if the velocity of the wind or fluid that moves in the front of our sail is bigger than the velocity of the uh, fluid that moves on the back of the sail, then the pressure on the front of the sail has to be less than the pressure on the back of the sail. So if you look at this equation and we look at the left-hand side of the equation, if I increase the front velocity, then I have to decrease the front pressure to compensate. And so the same thing on the right, if I increase my or decrease my velocity on the backside, then I have to increase my pressure to offset that decrease. And so if we look at our picture, now, because this path length is longer, but we need our flow rate to be the same, then the velocity, the velocity on the longer part, which was the front, has to increase and the Velocity on the back side has to decrease. 
So because the, uh, the air needs to move on a longer path length, it needs to do that faster so that it can complete the same path in the same amount of time, right? So if they, if they have to go through this, if they have to complete their journey in the same amount of time and they have to go different distances, then the velocities have to be different. And so that's why going around the longer path length, the fluid needs to increase its velocity. And then like we were saying on this slide, because that velocity is uh, bigger on the front, that means that the pressure on the front has to be less. And then if we had our boat, and our sail like this, because the wind was coming this way. Then this pressure differential because PB is bigger than PF, there will be some net pressure. So because PF is less than PB, then PB minus PF would be greater than zero. And so because there's some net or, or net pressure, so there's some net pressure, and we know that pressure is just force over area, then that also means that there's some net force that can carry us, carry our boat into the wind. So this is something that people figured out well before they knew how any of this math or physics worked, but they figured out a way to sail into the wind. So that's kind of impressive. And then also impressive that we have all this math and physics to explain how that works. Okay, so that's how boats work and planes work in a similar way. So for flight, so for an airplane wing, you have a similar shape to the sail. And it'll look something like this. So this is a cross section of an airplane wing. And our wind is coming from this direction. And so again, as the wind goes over the wing, so the path length at the top is longer. And so just like before, because the path length is longer, that means that the velocity at the top is bigger, greater. And the path length at the bottom is shorter. And so that means that the velocity is less. And then the same logic applies. So because the velocity is less, that means that the pressure on the bottom, compared to the pressure at the top. So the pressure at the bottom is greater than the pressure at the top.
And so you have some net pressure that points up. Some net pressure. And because you have a net pressure pointing up, you also have a net force that points up. And so this net force pointing up, we call lift. And so you could think of this as the wind moving to the right as I've drawn it, or you could imagine that the wing and the airplane is moving to the left and that's forcing the air to move over the wing. And so that's how airplanes take off, right? So they build up enough speed so that they can have enough air moving over the top and the bottom of the wings so that they can create this pressure differential and that pressure differential gets them lift and they can start flying. So that's not really how birds start flying, right? So birds will flap their wings and that's kind of similar to the sailboat thing. So if you're pushing down with your wings, then you're having collisions with the air that are beneath your wings. So you're pushing off using conservation of momentum. But then once they start gliding and soaring through the air, then they're using the same type of flight. So the takeoff might be a little different, but once they're up there, then it'll be the same kind of principle. So all of this is just something good to understand conceptually. We probably won't work any kind of math problems with this. So any questions about this? So the next thing that we'll talk about is viscosity. And this is represented by the Greek letter eta, which is kind of an N, looks like an N with a curly tail. And so this is kind of analogous to the coefficient of friction. And so that was when two solids were sliding against each other. And viscosity is dealing with fluids either sliding against other fluids or sliding against some solid, like the container that it's in. And so higher viscosity means that there's more resistance. And so something is harder to pour. So some examples of a viscous fluid would be like syrup or molasses. And then lower viscosity means less resistance. So easier to pour and so stuff like water or alcohol are easy to pour. And so the way that we measure eta or the viscosity I'll, let's see. I guess I'll do that on the next slide. 
So any questions about this? So high viscosity, hard to pour, low viscosity, easy to pour. Okay, so the way that you measure this is we take some fluid and we wedge it between two things that have some, so two solid objects that have some area. And we apply some force. to the top object and we determine what force we need to apply to this object so that it moves at a constant velocity. And the, the two solid objects will be separated by some length L. And so this is kind of the experimental setup. And the equation that we get from this is that the viscosity of this fluid is equal to the force times the length over the velocity times the surface area. So if we look at all of these units, so the unit for force is Newton, which is kilogram meter per second squared. Length, it has unit of meter. Velocity has units of meter per second. And area has units of meter squared. So this meter squared would cancel with both of these meters. The second would cancel out with that second. And so you get kilogram over meter second. So this would be the standard unit, but there are other units that you can use, and they talk about those in the textbook. And so when we use this, Viscosity, we're talking about fluids that are moving. So now we'll talk about uh, what do we mean by something, a fluid moving. And so that's when fluids move, we call it flow. And there are two types of flow. There's laminal, laminar flow and turbulent flow.
So in laminar flow, there are no mixing of fluids or fluid layers. And then in turbulent flow, you do have mixing. And so basically you can think of laminar flow as smooth and turbulent flow as turbulent or not smooth. So when you are on an airplane and you hit turbulence, uh, what's happening is you're hitting some patch of air that is getting all mixed up. And so the if you think about what we talked about with how the airplane flies, if the wind is not moving over the wings of the airplane like you want it to, then that would make that could make your plane be very bouncy or it could even cause you to drop significantly because the pressure is not working out the same way that it should. Okay, so we have those two definitions for flow. And then what we're gonna talk about for the rest of class is gonna be laminar flow. And so we're gonna use that viscosity that we talked about in a minute to uh, describe how things, how fluids can flow either next to each other or uh, through some container that they're in. And so we've seen the flow rate before Q. These two P's are both pressure and R is the resistance to flow. So you could think about that as kind of a, a friction force maybe. And so the first thing to note in this equation is that the, so we have these two different pressures and what this is telling us is that fluids flow from areas of low pressure to high pressure. Right, so if P1 was bigger than P2, then Q would be greater than one. And so if you had P1 over here and P2 over here, then you would expect your fluid to go in this direction. But if P1 was less than P2, then Q would be Q would be negative one or less, sorry, this should be greater than zero. And this should be less than zero. And so in the red case, you would get the fluid would want to travel from P2 to P1. Yes. The arrows are the direction that the fluid will go. And so this resistance to flow is going to depend on the viscosity of the fluid. And so this is the resistance in a 
tube. So the resistance equals the, or is proportional to the viscosity times the length of the tube over the radius of the tube. So this is resistance to flow. This is the viscosity. This is the length. And this is the radius. So you'd have some tube. like this, that has some length L and some radius R. And so if you were to plot the resistance, so I'll, I'll plot this in red. So if little r increases, then the resistance would have to decrease. So the opposite of what I said. And then also, if you make your tube longer, then you would get more resistance. It would be harder to push a fluid through a longer tube. And it's easier to push a fluid through a wider tube is basically the, the conceptual part of this. So if we put all of this together, we have this resistance to flow in a tube and we look at the, uh, this equation for flow rate, pressure and resistance to flow. If we put that all together, we get the following equation. And so the flow rate equals pressure one minus pressure two times pi r to the fourth over eight pi l squared or l just up. And so now what we just talked about with the resistance is the opposite for the flow rate. So for the flow rate, as you get further out from the center or you increase your R, then your flow rate is going to increase. And as you increase the length of your tube, the flow rate is going to decrease. And so just a quick example of how this can come into play. If you have artery buildup, or sorry, plaque buildup in your arteries. So let's assume that your heart will pump at the same pressure differential and you have the same length of your veins and arteries and stuff then we have this statement. So I just divided the radius to the other side. And so I said the pressure and the length, the pressure that the heart outputs and the length of your artery is gonna stay the same. So this is just a constant.
And so now if I take, so let's say healthy artery has radius R1 and a bad artery has radius R2, then we can compare the flow rate between these two arteries. So if we solve for Q2, And so now we said that R2 is smaller than R1. And so if you plug numbers into this equation, you would see that Q2 is less than Q1. And so maybe that makes sense to conceptually already that if you have stuff clogging up your arteries, you'll get less flow through your arteries.